Hello again, everyone. I'm Eric Sperling. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode, episode four of All in Education's Pake Sepas. I'd like to welcome today's experts. We have Stephanie Parra. She is the executive director of All in Education. Dr. Francisco Moreno. He is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Arizona College of Medicine. And Jacita Schaefer. She is a, a school safety program social worker at Carl Hayden Community High School. So before we get to our panel today, I do want to mention All in Education is a local nonprofit organization that exists to build in Arizona where all communities have access to opportunity and justice. Now their work is focused on strengthening the Latino community by closing the representation gap to build power, influence, and authority across Arizona boardrooms and classrooms. And through this monthly series, Pake Sepas on Education is working to bridge their advocacy efforts across multiple factors outside of the classroom that are impacting the educational outcomes of students. They're calling these factors the social determinants of education. Now, Pake Sepas will focus on having real thought-provoking conversations with leaders and community members and identify solutions to work towards creating meaningful changes in the systems that are meant to serve our community. So today's conversation is going to expand on how untreated and undiagnosed mental health issues can have devastating impacts on a student's long-term success. So as always, before we start the panel though, let's hear from the young man who has been sharing his personal stories with us, helping us see different perspectives on these critical issues. Here's Emiliano. I've always been an emotional person. I think one thing that really affected my mental health as a kid and as a teenager was my, the education system. I was a kid who was outgoing. I talked a lot and I answered a lot of questions and I had a lot of self-confidence. A lot of teachers and a lot of people shut me down and made me feel little. That dwindled a lot of my self-confidence and had me spiral into a lot of anxiety and depression. It didn't help that I grew up in a household where my parents didn't have the capacity or the knowledge of how to support us emotionally or mentally. I was pretty early on depressed as a kid. In the Latino community, the man um, does not have a right to share how they feel. Um, you have to man up. You have to, you can't say anything about how you feel. You're not seen, um, you know, masculine enough. The machismo, uh, you know, term is something that's thrown around um, in the Latino community. And as a kid, the only emotion I could share was anger. And that's what is acceptable for men in the Latino community is to feel anger, to feel brutish. We can't feel sad, we can't feel happy, we can't feel depressed, anxious. I pushed a lot of people away. One day I'd be in a really good mood and everyone would be my friend and the next day I'd be, I hate everyone. There were times where I, I had a low self-worth, and so I always questioned myself if I was worthy of enough to go to college. That tr trickled into my college life. Um, I would always question if I was, if I'm worth it to be here, if I'm smart enough. I switched majors because I didn't feel like I was good enough. I've actually done a lot better. I'm actually going to pursue a master's of arts in mental health counseling, clinical mental health counseling at, the Northern, at Northern Arizona University. One of my biggest goals in, in my career is to break stigmas and break boundaries and push you know, social stigmas about mental health in the Latino community and in Western culture. And it's not something that we should take lightly. Um, the Latino community has one of the highest rates of suicide. We wanna have students be at the top of you know, their game and be the best student they can be, but we don't address the shortcomings we have with them and not you know, addressing those mental health issues. Kids are having mental health issues as young as, you know, elementary school. Kids are having so many behavioral health issues as a result of this pandemic, and we need to start addressing those or things we're gonna have a lost generation of students. Well, wow, so appreciative of Emiliano sharing his stories with us. And as he mentioned, you know, we know the pandemic has caused mental health disorders to rise drastically. So Stephanie, uh, let's start with you and let's talk about, because last episode um, we were talking about the social determinants of education. We we're talking about health care, but why is it so important, do you think, and from all in education's perspective, to, to talk about mental health as a separate conversation? Yeah. So Emiliano said it in his, in his statement here. In the Latino community, 
Uh, mental health is not something that you should talk about. You're supposed to hold your emotions in, keep it together, pretend like everything is fine and great, um, when on the inside you might be falling apart. Mm. And so for us, when we talk about um, taking care of oneself, it is important that we take not just care of our physical bodies with health care, uh, but that we also focus on our social and emotional well-being um, and our mental health fitness. And so for me, this, in com this conversation is so critical um, and important to have as a standalone conversation so that we can really work on breaking down the stigma that exists with not talking about not feeling well. Yeah, you said that was one of his main priorities. I want to break the stigmas. I want to break boundaries. And we're so happy to have Dr. Moreno with us. Um, can you share with us, and we'll put it on the screen. I think these are from 2019. Just some data when we're talking about mental health, maybe not just K-12, but also to the university level. Yes, absolutely. And then thank you again, Eric and Stephanie, for the opportunity to participate here with us. And so mental health is such an important uh, challenge that we're confronting, and that's true for um, people of all ages, but particularly uh, in, the, in the young as well. Um, as we can uh, see here in the, um, uh, in the information that is presented in the screen, we have about 40% of students at the college level who experience a significant mental health issue. And what that means is not that you, they just get a little sad here or there, but they actually have a, a serious problem that requires intervention, some form of counseling or medical treatment for this condition. And uh, of course, half of the mental health issues uh, that people will experience during their life are visible, they're present and diagnosable by, uh, by the end of uh, uh, middle school by about mm -hmm. age 14 and three quarters of them by the end of college or those of us that are not going to go to college by the age of 24. And so this is, this is a big deal, uh, especially when we recognize that uh, most people are not really seeking care um, and uh, uh, the terrible complications that mental health issues would have, uh, such as uh, suicide, which is now the second leading cause of death for individuals from ages 10 to 34 years of age, and that's, that's just too much. This is staggering to see this all together, all on one slide, and as you mentioned, you know, ending there with suicide now becoming the second leading cause of death of those groups. And guys, I was telling you before, like this is so timely, especially in our community. And I was at an event last night and talking to a colleague who had just come from two funerals in the last two weeks that were suicides. One was a 16 year old boy, one was an 18 year old boy. And the conversations that we're having now are obviously so critical. And Jacinta, I wanna bring you into the conversation and talk about your work at Carl Hayden. Um, we just talked about some data, but what are you hearing directly from students? What has that experience been like for you? Um, sure, and, and uh, before I speak about that, I, I, I just wanted to, um, to emphasize the resiliency of our students and, and our community. Um, my campus is about 97% uh, Latino. Um, what we are seeing, and, and I have to say the 97% Latino because it's a uh, language that I have to um, kind of tailor when I'm speaking with families and my students, um, really high anxiety, um, panic attacks, um, throw up um, before showing up to class, um, you know, feeling like they can't breathe. Um, these are very scary physical feelings for our students. Not having the language that kind of goes with it uh, makes it even scarier. Um, so that's what we've been seeing. And I think in particularly coming back uh, from lockdown and being in a pandemic and then having to be um, interacting in social settings and in a maybe a classroom, you know, with very little movement. Um, you know, it just it just makes it so much more prominent. So, Stephanie, let's talk about how that those obvious things could, there can impede a student's ability to succeed yeah. in the classroom. Yeah. It could impact anybody, yeah. right? Um, a child, uh, not especially what Jacinta said, not having the language to express how you are feeling or to know who to talk to about how you're feeling. It can be incredibly overwhelming 
for children and young people, um, even adults. Um, and I, you know, I wasn't going to share this, but in my own personal journey, I struggled with panic attacks too as an adult, as recent as 2018. Um, and it wasn't until I found a way to cope and, and to find uh, my own language um, that I, I was able to like recoup and stay and, and get mentally healthy. Um, and that enabled my physical health as well. I think when we talk about mental health, the impacts that it has on your physical body, it's so connected, right? So you mentioned the, the vomiting, the, the, I, I had headaches and migraines, uh, the, the stomach pains that, that a child might get if a school nurse sees a child every single morning for a stomach pain. Mm -hmm. You might wanna ask what else is going on, right? Because there might be some underlying trauma or anxiety or stress that is just showing up for that child as a bellyache. Um, but they don't know how to, you know, how to have that language, how to have those conversations. So if that is how, how it's showing up physically, how can we expect children to mm -hmm. focus on teaching and learning, yeah. right? If they are so um, overwhelmed or stressed or anxious, and we want them to sit in a classroom and focus on reading, writing, and arithmetic, for you know, eight hours a day, um, but they don't have the language to tell you that actually I don't feel very well, or I'm getting, you know, I can't, I feel like I can't breathe in this environment. Um, so we need to give our give kids the space and the tools to have the language to articulate how they're feeling. Because if we don't focus on mental health of our young people, we're, you know trying to get them to attain academically is going to be an even greater challenge for us. So we really have to invest in the resources, the tools and the supports that kids need to be successful um, mentally and emotionally healthy. And I so appreciate you sharing with us, you know, your own personal struggles. I myself have gone through it. And then I always think about that too. Like I'm a 40 year old man going through this and I have the perspectives where, yes, I can pick up a a Jay Shetty book or, or something, or start learning a new skill to help me cope with this. Whereas our young people, there's, they have homework and textbooks and they're mm -hmm. trying, nobody's giving them the right books or the right tools. And so Dr. Moreno, I wanna ask you about something that, you know, uh, Emiliana was talking about, the stigma in the Latino community um, where, you know, he's not gonna talk about it, he's gonna keep it down and he's gonna, as he, as he said, he's gonna man up. So what are some of those, way, those ways that you think we can overcome having those conversations, overcome some of those boundaries so that it is okay for Emiliano to bring it up to his parents, to school. Yes, that's an excellent um, point. And thanks again, Stephanie, for sharing about your experience. I think we're all touched personally or very close to us in our families by mental health issues and substance use disorder issues also. And uh, Emiliano was talking about the machismo and the Latino culture. But this is something that goes more like more broadly than, than machismo alone, because machismo tends to kind of cover the male side of things, you know, being very macho uh, and masculine and it's not manly enough to be talking about feelings or expressing emotions or owning up to fears and concerns. Uh, but the same thing is true for women. There's this expectations that you're going to kind of be superwoman and live up over everything that is coming your way and that you're gonna be tough and you're gonna be able to kind of make it work and the roles that we put on women in our society are uh, in many cases a lot more demanding than those that we put on men. Um, and so um, our tradition, in, in, uh, the Hispanic community is also a very heterogeneous community, it comes from a lot of different countries. Uh, the nativity of uh, where we're coming from, how long we've been in our country, and, and how much do we interact with other groups and how much do we acculturate or, or how we acculturate is also something that determines how much comfort uh, and experience we get at navigating through uh, having uh, wellness in our emotions, in our relations, in our social lives as well. And so I think it's time for us to really allow ourselves not only the permission to talk about these things, but to recognize it as a responsibility that we must have within our families. And so I would like to invite the parents, the moms, the dads, the heads of household to start thinking of the wellness of our children as part of the parenting roles that we must have. It's not up to the doctors and the kids and the schools alone 
uh, and the programs that the government and our society may place for us, but uh, how do we do it so that we can start promoting that wellness? And so the more we learn, the more we ourselves become familiar and comfortable with these concepts, the better we can help our kids. Yeah, I love that thought of kind of that transition from giving us permission to talk about it to almost a responsibility mm -hmm. now, yes. especially, I'll keep coming back to it, those stats that we showed at the top of the show, how critical it is for us to take action. Um, Hasita, I want to talk to you about, you know, Phoenix High School, uh, Phoenix Union High School District, mm -hmm. and how we were just trying to figure out how can we collaboratively, collaboratively have more of these discussions so that we can break boundaries and break stigmas. And how are those going um, with you and the school district, trying to incorporate the family, the teachers, uh, mm -hmm. other touch points in a child's life? Uh, we're very fortunate. Our district is very uh, rich in resources. Um, we are able to, um, we're averaging about two social workers per campus, and our campuses tend to be very large. Uh, with the support of administration and the district as a whole, we've been able to um, this year implement uh, MOUs. Um, that are directly bringing in our community partners. Um, my closest community partner to my campus is uh, Valle del Sol. Um, I have monthly meetings um, with them where we staff all of our cases. Um, these are cases that probably need a little bit more attention that I, as a social worker, can provide on, on a campus during a, um, a school hour. Um, that conversation uh, with, with our collaborators does not happen unless I've had a conversation with the family. Uh, nothing will move forward if we're not bringing in the family um, portions and you know, kind of their, um, their ability to express how, how their student might be further helped. Um, so those are, are some beautiful things that we've been able to implement um, with the support of our, our district. So you mentioned resources, so we may expand on this a little later in the show, but what were those numbers again? How many social workers per students? Um, currently, we're averaging about one social worker per thousand students. Okay. Um, ideally, best practices really does call for um, one social worker per 250 students. Okay. So, Dr. Moreno, similar question there. With numbers like that, we know the resources, we know the challenges. Um, what are ways that we can be more collaborative with these different touch points in someone's life? Yeah, I think that's a very good, good point. Uh, you know, individuals do not just go to school. They are part of a larger community and we must make sure to take advantage of all those various elements. Now in school, the schools really uh, have a re responsibility to uh, not only be able to react and respond, uh, but to identify and proactively also work on promoting that wellness. And when you're overwhelmed, when you are understaffed, uh, in spite of the very good intentions, and we don't have the capacity, either the teachers, the social workers, or the school nurses, uh, to really um, be able to kind of uh, work and stay ahead of it and, and remain in the um, uh, capacity to prevent as opposed to just respond. And when it's time for us to respond, we don't always have the ability to respond because of the numbers as well. And this translates also to college. In college, about um, one in three students in our country um, are seeking psychological or psychiatric care. About one in four is receiving pharmacological interventions for problems like anxiety and depression. And that is really, we think, kind of like the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of people that are not talking about it, they're not recognizing it. Uh, many times we see physical symptoms or thoughts of, I want to die, or I'm going to start drinking more, or partying more, or behaving irresponsibly uh, when we're really needing to be recognizing what are, what are some of our emotions that we're going through and how do we best deal with those. And so um, moving to the families, to the churches, uh, to the social clubs, to the sports uh, teams, to working with coaches. Uh, it, it becomes really also a way of trying to network our opportunity to serve the students when we don't have enough resources. Stephanie, that was interesting to hear yeah. that uh, of prevention versus management sometimes. Yeah. And a lot of the resources are dedicated to management, yeah. and crisis management. Right. What were your thoughts when you heard? Well, it, it makes me go back to one thing we've been saying so much is that we often rely on schools to be everything for, yeah. for, for a, a community. 
um, and we're not equipped uh, to do it. We're overwhelmed, understaffed, um, and we have to also do teaching and learning, right? And so that's the core mission of, of a schoolhouse is to, is to focus on academics, but with all of the external social determinants, mental health being one, we also have to be a resource, but how to better leverage and create hubs of support for schools and students and families. And as you were talking, it even made me think about how how we support education professionals too, because um, the, the secondary trauma that they are taking in, the emotional stress and the grief that they are sharing with their students is also impacting them in their daily lives, right? And it's very hard to turn it off at you know three o'clock, four o'clock when you when you clock out. Um, I remember from my experience as a social worker how hard it was to turn it off. Um, and, and you take that home with you and how does it impact your personal family life um, as a professional. Um, so just thinking about how we create better supports for the school community as a whole, students, families, parents, education professionals um, need better support when it comes to, uh, when it comes to mental health. Uh, and so we have to make sure that we are investing in those supports uh, holistically when we think about education investments, uh, Jacinta said it, when in Phoenix Union, we're at one uh, social worker for every thousand kids. That, yeah. How can you manage a caseload of a thousand kids that you are doing crisis management probably really mm -hmm. quick, right? It's, it's get in, get out, get the resources, get the connections, and then move on to the next one. Um, and and uh, oftentimes kids need relationships. Yeah. If we're really going to make a difference and, and change those statistics and change those numbers, kids need authentic, meaningful relationships with adults who can help them develop the language, the coping skills, and how to, um, you know, how to take care of themselves holistically, emotionally, spiritually, all of it. Um, our kids need that support. I love talking to you, Steph, because you always do a great job of taking ideas and then really focusing on calls to action and actionable solutions. And so is one of the takeaways then what you were just alluding to is, hey, for a call out to community leaders out there, is it advocacy for more resources? What are, what are those specific takeaways, kind of what you were just summarizing there, that we should walk away with as community leaders saying, this is, what we, this is how we can play a role in changing some of those numbers? Yeah, leaders in the community can help us advocate to get more social workers um, uh, into our school campuses. They can help us make sure that those wraparound support services are accessible. Um, and you know, if you are leading a, a Valle del Sol or another um, community-based organization that is providing these resources, link up with your neighborhood school and see how you can be a, a value add and be a, um, a wraparound support so that we can really start to create hubs of support for, for kids and families um, and our educators as well. Jacinta? I'm loving it. Thank <laughs> you, Stephanie. Um, um, I really liked um, the wraparound uh, services and, and uh, where you started off where we cannot be everything to, to the whole community and students. So really trying to um, go out of our way um, to bring in all of those community centers, whether it's the Boys and Girls Club, um, whether it's even fun activities and, and showcase that to our students as another way of um, learning coping skills and, and being with um, in, in a positive environment. Dr. Mary, what are some of those, as we're talking here, those actionable solutions that community leaders, neighborhoods, any of us can take to start changing some of those numbers? Yeah, so I'm a psychiatrist, so I think of mental health wellness as a big priority for everybody. And as we see that um, uh, our children and ourselves are more and more involved in our cell phones and working mm -hmm. on um, on virtual inter interactions and social media. Um, we, I think, have moved away from a lot of the gains that we had had by being in contact with other people. So how are some ways in which we could be utilizing the tools that we have now, which is the phones, social media, and all of that, to really incorporate wellness into it? 
If we're not doing a lot of physical education at school, how about we do mindfulness meditation? How about we do uh, some kind of other type of uh, activity that, that teaches us uh, to learn, to listen to ourselves, to see how we're feeling, how other people feel, how we're impacting others, and how we can better manage those emotions. Um, these are, I think, uh, um, potential opportunities for wellness that are not only going to serve the student as they're trying to learn, because when, we, when we're anxious, you know, everybody has heard about the fight or flight response, mm -hmm. this sort of adrenaline response. When you are in that mode, all you're thinking about is survival and adapting in a way as opposed to learning, which is a, more of a, you know, a leisure kind of activity when you're kind of narrating and talking. And so uh, the same thing happens at work. And what are some of the predictors of people performing at work or staying at work or succeeding in our careers is, um, you know, having that ability to function, to be present, to contribute. And, and uh, so if, if we learn to do this well at school, it's something that is going to prepare our students to succeed during school, but also to succeed at work. It's a tool that is going to be helpful uh, later on. And so. If I can just yeah. add to that, because you, so I, I shared my, my personal experience and just to kind of bring it back home, it was learning how to breathe uh, through mm -hmm. mindfulness meditation that completely changed yeah. my life. Um, learning how to, how to do those practices every single day, I incorporate them into my daily mm -hmm. life. And it has dramatically changed my ability to manage my stress levels, my emotions, my anxieties, all of it. Um, and, and we teach kids so much, but we don't teach them how right. to breathe. This is so essential. Um, and, so it's, and it's an essential part of yeah. being a human. Um, yes. is learning how, how to breathe mm -hmm. to calm yourself down. If yeah. you can control your breath, you can control your mm -hmm. emotions, um, and you can, you, you, know, you can really manage your day-to-day -day in a more effective way. So. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was alluding to earlier. Like, I'm in my 40s, and it's taking me this many years to learn how to breathe and mm -hmm. learn how to do that. And trying to teach my son or daughter at such a young age the importance of that is a challenge. It really is. And so I think if we can start making them and having those conversations at an earlier age, not just in the home, but in different touch points yeah. at school where you talk to a, an educator about, okay, we're going to teach mindfulness today. And you know, that's, again, that's another stigma, like we're going to teach what? <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I think we should take it upon ourselves to encourage that, advocate for more of those type of learning sessions in school. I totally agree. Well, I mean, I, I would bet if we if we incorporated this and then did a study of like, did it increase test scores? Did it increase yeah. attainment, achievement for kids? Probably reduce discipline referrals as well, behavior issues. I would say that we can make an argument here for, for why this is going to be a good practice. Well, what's exciting about it is that those studies have already been taken place go. and they're published. Yes. We just have to put it together and apply. There's so much that we have learned through research and through practice empirically validated that is just not applied, it's not implemented. And so it's time to implement it. Right. And I know things are underway. There are certain mm -hmm. programs that are being implemented, but to your point earlier, if we can expand on those, I think that's when we'll really start making a dent in, in some of those numbers. So before we wrap up, just want to give everybody an opportunity to kind of, we've had incredible discussion here today, moving discussion, just some final thoughts on what we were talking about today and then maybe where we all can go as a community with our different roles that we play. We did kind of a call to action earlier, but just final takeaways here on the discussion we've had. I'll start. I'll start. Um, I really like this question. Um, I guess the last message that I would like um, for families and students to know is that depression can look in, um, very different. It can look um, as low motivation. It can look as uh, grades not being what they used to be. Um, it can look like um, my student is in the room, he's not coming out for dinner. Um, don't look for the depression that is showcased in movies. Um, look for changes that are happening with, with your family member, with your student, and have an honest and peaceful conversation. Um, if it feels like you need uh, to consult um, with somebody else, reach out to your to your school uh, and your district, and and look for a consultation with your uh, mental health provider at the at the school if it feels uncomfortable, like you wanna not, you're, like if you're not ready to move forward with that conversation with your teen. Yeah. Dr. Marina, 
I really like uh, that uh, uh, point uh, to really be aware that the stuff that's in the book or in the movie is not always the way it shows up. Yeah. We have to be looking for very subtle changes. Um, I'll also share personally uh, as a psychiatrist who is a clinical expert in depression, I almost lost uh, my oldest kid uh, to depression and the complications of depression through suicide. And yeah, I, I know all the symptoms. I teach the symptoms. I mean, I treat the patients with the symptoms, but then at home, things can be so sudden and the kids mm -hmm. don't look like they're depressed all the time mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. And so uh, the point I wanted to make is suicide is a huge deal and nobody sends you a memo to tell you watch how your kid is about to commit suicide. You have to be smelling out for it. You have to be intentionally checking with your kids to see how things are going. And if they talk to you in any remote way about thinking of death or a short future ahead of them and being hopeless, just take it as seriously as you can and look to your resources, the, whatever you can personally do, people in your community, your doctors, your churches, your neighbors, the people that you trust uh, to help you move it to the next phase where you can actually work with the individual to do something about it. So powerful. Thank you for sharing that. And Stephanie, that's what we've been talking about this whole time, like trying to balance self-care for ourselves as adults mm -hmm. right. and then still being able to spot when our children are in need and sometimes mm -hmm. even you, you are a professional i'm not a mm -hmm. professional we're not i'm not mm -hmm. a professional healthcare um person but i i need help if i'm going mm -hmm. to yeah. change the lives of my children who desperately need it right yeah. stephanie i mean that's what we're yeah. trying to do is balance that take care of myself but also be able to have the resources available to take care of the children and i think you just made an, an excellent point i think it's it's important to give ourselves grace, mm -hmm. right? Because we're not, even a, a professional can, mm -hmm. can, um, mm -hmm. can miss yeah, what it looks absolutely. like, right? And so give, give yourself mm -hmm. grace mm -hmm. um, and operate with kindness even to yourself in this moment, right? I think that's what I did in that moment. Right? When he said that I did, it gave myself a little bit of grace, like, whew, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and I, I think as we're all navigating through this, like, this is the journey of life, right? We're, yes. we're all navigating. We all got to give ourselves a little love and compassion uh, to, to self. Um, but, but there's so much that we can do for, for kids, for families, for education professionals. Um, and we have to make sure that as we think about um, how we're going forward, that leaders as a whole who are thinking about solutions and how, you know, how we address the impacts of, of the pandemic. How are we going to get ca kids caught up academically that we not lose sight of the impacts of mental health, of a child's social emotional well-being, and that we invest in the tools and the supports that they need uh, to be successful with this first. Well, truly appreciate everyone coming together to have this conversation. Some great takeaways from this panel as well. I want to thank everyone for joining us uh, on this edition of All in Education's Pake Sepas, the Social Determinants of Education. As a reminder, we'll continue building on the conversation every month, uh, bringing you these conversations, bringing you these topics. So thank you, Stephanie, Dr. Moreno, Jacinta, for providing insight and clarity around this topic. Before we go, though, Stephanie, I know you want to thank the Garcia Family yep. Foundation. Thank them so much for the everything they do in the community, but helping this show as well yes we are so grateful it's um, because of the support uh, from the Garcia Fam family foundation that we we're able to put on this series so super grateful for the, for the support and investment from them all right thank you so much make sure you tune in next month as we discuss how the school to prison pipeline has major consequences to student learning and the well-being of our communities thanks again we'll see you next time